Welcome everyone. This is our Wednesday Wisdom where we go over tips, tricks, and information on band instrument repair. Today we're going to show you a bunch of different aspects of the Busher saxophone family in preparation for sax temper. We're going to give you some tips and tricks uh, about how to handle these things as a player as well as lots of good stuff for the technician. We have a hashtag for today that is Busher Sax. Make sure you take that, put that in the comments below. That's going to give you a chance to win 15% off any of the courses that we have coming up in 2024 or 2023. Uh, we have our advanced saxophone course, which will go over some different busher padding topics. We have an engraving course, which is going to be on the 16th to the 18th of October, and that will show you how to remake your own busher logo. We also have in February a dry fitting and padding course, which will also handle the specific areas of how to repad a busher with standard pads. Most importantly, the Sax Smackdown. That's right. We have the Sax Smackdown on the February 23rd and 24th. So make sure you save the date. And we have a bunch of clinicians. We also have, uh, this is new, new update. I like like me right here. Yeah, uh, you really frames your face. Uh, the new update is that Jeff Peterson, who is the head technician at uh, Yamaha, Corporation of America out in Los Angeles. He's going to be here and he's going to bring the Yamaha family of saxophones. Uh, so we've got Yamaha, Theo Wani, Jody Espini, Espina. Yeah, Jody has, Jazz. Well, we've got uh, Arnold Montgomery. Arnold Montgomery is going to be here. We've got Key Leads is going to be here. Yeah. Uh, North Country Winds is going to be here. Great technician and also clarinet guru Miles DeCastro is going to be here. Sax Spy is going to Sax Spy. Yeah. Sax Spy is going to be here, as well as a couple of Napper technicians. We've got Stephen Georges. We've got Will Peak, uh, Ryan Walker, Ooh. and I think that's it for right now. I yeah, think yeah, that's yeah. It. I think S some other ones still kind of up in the air, but it's going to be an absolutely fantastic event. And yes. Really, it's almost going to be too good. When I thought, saw what was included, I was like, mm, that's borderline irresponsible. <laughs> <laughs> okay, free breakfast, free lunches, free dinners, free drinks. Yes. Bring your ID. Yes. Um, and then uh, more free drinks. And then, of course, saxophone stuff. You get to hang out here at the Sax Pro Shop, Music Medic, get to peruse all the tools. Um, yeah, it's going to be the 23rd and then the 24th. There they are hey, right there, Sax Smackdown. Uh, we Very may nice. or may not make a saxophone explode. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm going to try, but we'll see. But let me also get to the winner for today. Uh, we have our giveaway for our, our Oleg oh. Pro Sax Enhancers. Uh, so this is the person who is going to win this is Nevin Alasta 3273 That's the username. So please send me an email to rich or ich at musicmedic.com, and we will get you your discount code for any of the courses we have coming up in 2023-24, as well as the Oleg Pro sax enhancers. All right, Ryan, let's get right into the history of the Busher saxophone Busher. family. Uh, Bushers were originally created by a guy named Gus, 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 Busher. Gus, Busher. Gus Busher. Gus Busher. First, we, I get, before we talk about, I guess, the instruments where they came about, uh, how to actually pronounce correctly oh. yes. the name of this manufacturer. The correct pronunciation of this family name is Bisher. Is it? Bisher, yes. I think okay. most people, I know you and I, both say busher 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 yeah. busher when i say busher you know what i mean yes uh, i've heard people say busher uh if you say busher something's a little off you you may have a little bit of peanut butter on the roof of your mouth you might want to clear it out <laughs> uh but it, typically we say busher so you'll hear us say busher those of you that are purists and say busher we apologize we apologize. Okay. Come to the Sax Sax Smackdown. You can fight one of us. Uh, <laughs> 23rd and 24th, I'm fighting the 23rd. Rich is fighting the 24th. That's right. Um, come fight us for the correct pronunciation of Busher. But yes, they are fantastic horns. Uh, very popular in the 20s and the 30s. I think probably the peak would be like the middle to late 30s. Uh, that's when horns like this came about, which is uh, typically called a Busher Aristocrat Series 1 in the Busher Circles. Yes. Um, Busher people are fans of these horns, uh, are pretty fanatic about it. They yeah. are uh, great people. They really know their history. Hopefully they're watching and can write in and maybe correct us if it we is said a, that something wrong. It is a niche kind of it is very much, yes. instrument. And so if you have any comments or questions or if you want to learn more about Busher saxophones, make sure you put that in the comments below. Make sure you like, share, and scri uh, sub not scribe. 
That'd scribe, be, scribe it down. Subscribe. Start writing. <laughs> uh, of course, pushers were uh, made popular by a variety of saxophonists in the classical world. The, the German school guru Sigurd Rascher yes. uh, performed on Very a pusher. Uh, some of the jazz guys back in the day. I know Johnny Hodges played a uh, yep. an yep. aristocrat for a while, I believe. Correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah, yeah. I will. I would if you were, but you were correct. And uh, I, I do believe Sonny Rollins, early in his career, played oh, really? pictures of him playying with the uh, Busher Big B, uh, oh, which yeah. came out a little bit after this this model right here. Uh, but very popular horns. Very. They have a very unique tone center to them. It's very much a very. They suited um, for the classical world. Yeah, very, large, very large well. chamber very mouthpiece, well. and they they have a certain ergonomics to them, mm -hmm. uh, different than the French style saxophones. So, Ryan, why don't we talk a little bit about the components of these instruments that make yes. them some very unique, yeah, very unique features on this. We're going to talk about some unique features, but two main uh, kind of idiosyncrasies of the Busher line. We go. We have some busher stuff out here. Uh, would be the pads, how they're actually held in. Um, busher pads traditionally are held in with this snap that actually acts as the rezzo. So if I pop this guy off, and it's just like a button. There it goes. Just pops right off. You can see it right there. And I pull out that pad. This is an original pad, and they were originally designed to have these metal backed pads put in them. Okay, and they didn't have any kind of adhesive or shellac behind it. Uh, so they were just snapped in like so, and you can see how the leather was attached to that. It was stitched around and then pulled tight. Um, nowadays, when we install pads in to Busher Sax in the Sax Pro Shop, we will use traditional pads and we will actually just punch a hole using our Busher hole punch set. Very cool. Like that. Um, to actually modify it. And you can see there's a pad I did earlier that I modified. I punched a larger hole. Uh, and you can see what consists of that. You have this little aiming mandrel right here. Lines everything up. And then you have three punches off in the corner. Um, I just picked out whatever punch was the correct size to allow me to go around that spud. Uh, and then that allows me to snap it in. The one thing I will say is when we do install, um, and I think I said it earlier, um, when we do install new pads into bushers, we don't use the traditional metal back pads. Uh, we use a regular pad. This is a Musicmatic soft feel pad. Um, but I will use shellac behind these pads. Okay? I don't put them in dry. Um, when I use that, that adhesive shellac, or if you're using hot glue, that's fine too. Um, it allows me to kind of level that pad, get those micro adjustments. So my installation process is once I punch the hole, I will take the rezzo and I will put it like so. And then using my, usually the Z gun, um, I will apply shellac to this outer portion here. I try not to get it to the inside of this spud. Although, um, if I do get it on the inside of this snap, it's not a big deal. Okay. okay. It's not a big deal whatsoever. So don't worry about, oh no, I got shellac. I got to start over and throw this pad away. Not true. Okay. So I get shellac over here. I flatten it out on a bench block. I then heat the back or the front of this pad cup up. That allows the shellac to kind of become molten again when I press this in and then I snap it in. Usually I'll use a pair of pliers because this can get warm when you're heating it up. Uh, and this now allows me to get my floating uh, allow me to do my, my seating like normal where I'm heating it up and I'm, I'm maneuvering things around using a leak light inside. So there you go. Snap on pads. I believe a lot of people call them snap in pads. I think traditionally they are snap on pads. Okay. And then what other kinds of pads can we put in the, now since the snap on pads aren't really available anymore, we, we're putting traditional saxophone pads in. What are some other options that There's another they option from? would be Rue pads. Rue pads are absolutely fantastic in bushers. In fact, anytime we do a uh, an overhaul, Uber haul on a busher aristocrat, we will most likely put the rue pads. And typically the white rue pads, classical players like the white, the, the look, it's very clean, uh, especially if you have a nice bright silver horn. Um, but any rue pads work. And even the traditional tan pads uh, work as well. But rue pads are particularly good in bushers. The other thing I will mention is you notice this guy right here, even the smallest pad on Busher, this top stack C, will have a snap. And even the smallerest pad, <laughs> which would be for the octave, this is the body octave pit. You can see remnants of a little spud in there, and they, believe it or not, were snap-ins. Yes. Okay, or snap-on pads. The, the, the actual back of the 
the Octopad had the little, little um, I guess, snap part. It snowed yeah. into it, so you would snap that guy in. Most of the time when you see these, these have been ground out because, well, putting just a traditional pad is actually much easier than snapping one in. But you can see even the small guys have their little spuds. So, Ryan, spuds and snaps. That, that, those are the busher pads and snaps, very unique to that maker. And then what is what do you have there? I have my springs. And bushers of this time period um, were known for having what's called Norton Springs. Norton Springs. Um, but they were screwed in. Right? You can see here, let's see if I can grab this guy right here and get close enough so that you can see the screw portion of it. Focus, focus. There it is. Okay, so you can see right down there, there's the screw portion. So that would actually screw in to the post itself. Let's see if I can get a good angle of one right in here. Okay, so you can see there are the springs and they screw right into the post. They are right there. There's those two little flatheads. Um, so it made it easy for whoever, usually the, the, the player or the technician, um, to remove and actually replace these springs. Um, now, with this being a horn that's close to 100 years old, finding original Norton springs practically impossible. Uh, it's like finding a five-leaf clover. Okay, uh, You skip right over the four and go right to the five. Um, so they are kind of difficult to find, especially the original ones. Um, but the manufacturer or uh, supplier Freeze, Freeze Tools, does sell some replacement Norton springs. And what they do is they make them with stainless steel mm. springs. You can see stainless steel. They do make them extra long. And then what you do is you would cut that, trim that back with a pair of wire snips um, to the appropriate length. But that makes a suitable replacement for these Norton springs. Okay. There we are. So those are the two main, sorry, two two main, oh, sorry, two for our English. Don't want to do that. Two main uh, uh, kind of very, very unique things about Busher saxophones. There are other things that are different as well, and I guess we can kind of talk about some of the things that we change. Yeah, let's go over some of the mods that you guys do when we do an overhaul or uber haul, sorry. Wait, what is up with the, the Uber Hall being confused with overhaul? It's it's, it's Uber Hall. Yes, Uber Hall. Yes. The things it, done in this shop are, are you gotta good. put the umlauts on there yeah. too, the Uber two dots right over top, the umlauts. And um, so to, Ryan, tell us a little bit about some of the mods that are, are commonly requested by players uh, during the Uber Hall. So a, a lot of times there's busher owners out there or there may be very serious saxophonists and they need an instrument that is a little more modern. How do you guys take this original uh, instrument, which is excellent in itself, but improve it so that it can be a little more ergonomic and a little more responsive for, say, in the modern yes. discerning It's player. a lot like trying to have a Model T run in NASCAR. Because mm. okay? a lot of these horns are you know, 80, 90 years old, and they're competing with horns that have been made last week. Um, so there are some things that we do to change. Uh, I'm just going to start at the top and work my way down. The one okay. very first thing would be this little octave square sliding. You can see it hopefully right there. I have one that I picked from an instrument. And there is that little octave square. Um, that is one of the first things that will actually change. It's a nice, easy, quick mod. We'll get rid of that octave square and we'll set it up to be like a normal kind of fork mechanism. You can see it right there. You use your heat shrink tubing. A lot of times you can use Teflon tubing uh, and that provides that smooth action. But that original octave score tends to wear out. You have dissimilar metals rubbing against each other. That harder metal is going to win, which introduces lost motion. So that's one of the very first things that we change okay. about it. Um, working myself down the horn, another area that we tend to change is this interaction between our side C lever and the actual side C pad cup. Um, so what we have is we have a spring that holds tension on my lever and I have another little flat spring that hold that allows the low C to open up. So when I drop this lever down, that spring will open up my low C sharp pad cup. Well, let's say this is stuck. You have root pads, it's not going to happen. But let's say you don't have root pads. You open this up and mm. it's going to stay shut. Okay? So it's not physically opening it. Uh, and sometimes you have that opposing spring tension going, working against each other. It can be a tough area to adjust. Um, so what we do is we change that side key mechanism to a fork 
So we get rid of the spring that's underneath this pad cup. The lever itself is still sprung. So this allows us that even if this does get stuck, it's not going to. It's got root pads in it. Okay, it physically opens that key. And now you can adjust that normal side key fork with normal materials, hot glue filled shrink tubing, Teflon tubing, and it makes for a very easy and uh, very slick adjustment. Okay. Working myself down a little bit further is I come to this key right here, which is my G lever. And if you notice on this guy, how my first two fingers are pretty level, my G really should be here, but whoa, look yeah. at that right there. What has happened? Well, over the years of playing, this big, long lever tends to flex. We have big, long brass keys right here. It tends to get bent out of proportion because there's nothing under here stopping that. In fact, if I pressed as hard as I wanted to, I could make this key touch touch the body of the saxophone. All right? So one of the things that we do as far as a modification, we do this on quite a bit of horns, is a contact. And you can see, first off, the keys have been properly leveled, so I, I don't have this G key down super far. If you look under it, there's my contact. Um, so what, this, what happens with this style of contact is that pad closes first. There's a little bit of space under there. And if I maybe I'm a little heavy handed and press very, very hard, it doesn't uh, get this, this key arm bent out of proportion like you saw on this one right here. Are there any other contact points you guys use? There sure are. There's one here for the side C. Okay, right under this little arm right here. I don't know if you can see it, um, but what that does is that allows that when it touches, it's a firm feeling under your fingers. The original style you can see right here when I press it, there's a little bit of flex right there. See that? Because there's nothing stopping it aside from the lever that's all the way up here. So I have all this flex and nothing underneath this. Okay, we put that directly under here. Another thing you'll see directly below that right there is a side key guide. All right. If I look at this horn here, especially from this angle, you can see how this touch is kind of it's a little wonky. It's bent out of shape. It's there. bent out of shape. And that is because of this long arm. When players play this, it kind of slides and bends this out of the way. With this horn here, you can see having this half guide is anytime I play, now it's not going to allow that to get bent out of proportion. I can put Teflon on there, so if it does happen to touch it, it's going to be super slick and super smooth. Mm -hmm. All right? um, so that's another area. When we get into other stuff, modifications, there's actually another reason why we do this too. Uh, but I'm not going to talk about that now. We're going to talk about it during our advanced saxophone course. That's right. Yeah. September 18th and 21st. We that's still right. have a couple of spots left, so if you are interested in coming here at a beautiful time of here, time of here, time of year in uh, mm -hmm. Wilmington, North Carolina, uh, you, we can sign up for the advanced saxophone course. We will go over basically all over the, we'll review all the basic stuff that we do in the basics course, and then we'll dive into the advanced yes. topics. So whether you're a technician uh, or you're a budding technician, you can come. Or a serious hobbyist. A serious hobbyist You have experience well. taking the instrument apart, putting pads and key corks and all that stuff, you know, the basics. Sign up for the advanced course. And if you take that Busher hashtag, uh, which I have somewhere, where did it it's, go? It's, it's hidden it's, there. Uh, it's, oh, it's behind. It's behind this. Okay. Uh, if you take that, there it is. There Busher, it is. Take right Busher Sacks, put that in the comments below. You can be entered to win 15% off course tuition, which is, uh, and I'll announce the week, uh, the winner next week. All right. So, Ryan, let's go to my favorite mod, which is the F yes. F sharp arm bar. Yeah, F sharp arm bar. So that's what I call this little guy right here. It's, it's attached to my F sharp key. It's a bar. It's an arm. It's an arm bar. It's an F sharp arm bar. Uh, and what this allows me to do is my for my articulated G sharp. When I open my G sharp and I play any note or any finger on this right hand, you can see how it closes that key at the same time. Um, Busher also had this little idea of a little kind of a tilting half moon for your bist. Um, it's an interesting design, but there's no, it's not easy to adjust. It's not easy to adjust for players and it's not easy to adjust for technicians. So what we do is we add in an adjustable F sharp arm bar. So it's like a modern one now. So it has an adjustment screw over top of the G sharp. It also has an adjustment screw over top of your bis arm. And the whole thing is set on this slider. So I can actually move this whole bar out or in, depending on key heights, which we will talk about during our advanced saxophone course, September, mm -hmm. through the other thing. So, <laughs> so please sign up for that. But 
Um, so this adjustment is, or this modification is great for adjustments. And I know you like it as a player. I, I like it as a player because it, it allows me to, I, you know, I know mods are kind of a little bit of a controversial thing mm. among, among collectors. A little bit. Uh, but A little bit. <laughs> as a person who actually plays saxophone, uh, and for many years, it still makes a little bit, a couple dollars. Yeah, you there's know. tens of dollars we made as a saxophone. And between us, we probably made about $20. Dollars. We probably, at least, at least 20 21 maybe. Mm. Uh, <laughs> Slow down. <laughs> there's what I, Steve Jobs. <laughs> what, I, what, what I like about the F-sharp uh, arm mod is that, I mean, not only for the technician, it allows you to set the, the action between the left hand and the right hand independently, mm -hmm. but as a player... I always know to check my G sharp, uh, you know, on my modern saxophone. I play a low D, I press the G sharp key, you know, uh, sometimes just a little bit of a turn, even a quarter of a turn on the adjustment screw allows me to make the horn play uh, well again. Yeah, just a little turn. Sometimes yeah. you, you just look at the screw and just yell, righty! <laughs> It just moves to the right a little bit and it just adjusts itself. So, but yeah, that is a fantastic mod that very, we will do. Yeah, very quite thoughtful. A bit. Very thoughtful and, and best of both worlds. Yeah. Okay, so what else do you have? Another modification we do, and sometimes this ends up being a repair and a modification, you can see is this guy right here. This is in some rough shape, this low C key guard. So, a lot of times when we get something that's bent out of proportion like this, a lot of times we'll just make it new. OK, um, you know, just bend the, the brass, uh, you know, tubing or the wire to whatever we need. The other thing that we'll do is when we do remake this, we will actually make this taller. Mm. The main reason that allows us to open up this low C, which tends to make the D not as stuffy. And we will talk about some tuning and toning things, September or whatever, through the whatever during our advanced saxophone course. You'll learn why we do this, uh, but we will actually make a taller low C guard. The other thing that we will do is you can see how the original ones are attached right here to the tone hall. This is not a great idea because if I get any kind of trauma or hit right here, it's going to cause this tone hall now to dip down. I'm going to have some really bad times. Mm -hmm. So what we do is when we remake the C guard, you can see we do make it taller and we actually come down and connect it to the body. So now it's not only protecting the key, it's protecting the tone hall as well. We do the same thing on the other side. So this is another modification that is extremely popular. Uh, it helps with tuning and toning and obviously protection of that key. So, oh, another modification that is very, very kind of uh, complex, it serves multi-purposes, is for this low C sharp. So on the low C sharp for a Busher Aristocrat Alto, we have this lever that comes down. We have this little connector right here, little hinge tube here, a spine, and then another hinge tube under here. And then we have the actual C sharp, which is part of the bottom stack. So we have three keys that are needed to actuate this C sharp. So getting this key lined up with this one so that this works, and then we're kind of limited on the motion that we can open this with. So what we've done is we've devised a modification using a mini ball. You can see right there, they're typically used. A lot of linkages and brass instruments use these. Uh, linkages we actually sell. Both of these, the uh, the male and the female portion of the mini ball, but what you can see is we've actually taken it and gotten rid of that little connector with the hinge tubes and all that, and we've put this mini ball. This allows, um, this takes up any compensation for any loose key work that may be a result. Um, so it's super quiet, super slick. The, the main feature of this is this allows us to change the length of these arms right here, and right here, in fact, this mini ball is actually on a slider. So I can actually independently adjust the, uh, the height, I guess, as, as it were, uh, which in turn would adjust how open my C sharp gets. So if you've got a, a low note that's a little stuffy, you can now actually adjust the C sharp to the, the height of where it needs to be without affecting the other areas of the instrument. Exactly. Uh, yep. And yeah, it doesn't change killer. the travel of the C sharp if you do it right. That's important, okay? So we, we only have a limited amount of motion here, but I need this key, this C sharp here, to really open up. With this, I'm limited. With this, I'm not, okay? Cool. So fantastic modification that we tend to do. Um, we also do quite a bit of work on the left-hand table, okay? Um, these, you can see, are this, this uh, left-hand table is, I'm gonna say not the most comfortable, but when they're set up correctly, actually can be very comfortable. Um, it makes it very easy to slide from low B to B flat, 
if the key touches are set up properly. It allows you to go from C sharp to B very easily. You could go down if you wanted to, but once things are set up, it's actually very easy to just slide right across for this left-hand table. Um, so that's another thing that we, we tend to do is, is uh, you know, do quite a bit of work on left-hand tables. And you can see what we do with this guy here is quite a bit of beautification things as well. This guy started out life like this, looking very similar to this, maybe even worse. Okay? Okay. But what we've done is we've done our media blasted finish. We've sent it off and had it silver plated. The engraving was recut, so I recut all this engraving. This was there. I added some extra stuff, so there's stuff on the bow here. There's stuff on the back. Great. You can see this guy here, extra not, engraving. Not so much stuff, but... Yeah, stuff, thank engraving you. Engraving stuff. Engraving yes. stuff, exactly. So what the, another thing that we have didn't really mention is we've actually changed the left hand, or sorry, right hand thumb hook, okay? Original one was just a soldered on. It wasn't really adjustable. We added our, our uh, adjustable thumb plate and our comfort hook thumb rest. And, and Ryan, I wanted to tell people watching, if you get one of these comfort rest thumb hooks, take it to your technician and have them contour to the body like Ryan has done yes. here. It is a, a game changer in terms of the ergonomics. So normally these, these comfort rests comes and they're all kind of squared off and, and straight and they're not as comfortable as after they kind of fit them to the horn. They also take the, the actual hook and they'll bend that up a little bit. So if you have a little larger thumb, uh, that's going to make it more comfortable. But I will say, if you get this thumb hook, because it's a very inexpensive replacement thumb hook, it's like 35, 40 bucks, something like that, and you have it fitted to your instrument, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be a night and day difference in terms of feel between the stock one and the actual custom fitted one. So take it to your tech and you'll have great success for that. Ryan, can you also talk about the Soprano. We didn't talk about it in the we, other stream, but let's go yeah, over some of the things you've done with the, the Soprano. Absolutely. So yeah, if you watched our Facebook, we didn't really talk about this, but this is a Busher Soprano, curved Soprano sax. It is keyed up to high F, so this is the one that everybody's looking for. This, even though it is much, much smaller than the Alto, may have more modifications mm. per square inch. Um, so again, you can see right off the bat, it's been replated, silver plated. Um, this was re-engraved. Nothing extra really was added onto this. Um, it's small enough as it is. Uh, but starting at the top, yeah, octa square was removed. Let's see, we added a key foot onto the A key, which allows us to adjust the um, key heights independently. There is, you can see there's that half guide, so these don't get put out of proportion. Uh, let's see, it's got custom rollers. You can see there, so custom C and E flat rollers. Same thing with the left-hand table. In fact, this whole left-hand table has been redesigned. All of these touch pieces, uh, well, maybe not aside from this C sharp, but the, the B and the B flat, and then definitely the G sharp are all modified. So it has a modern style, aristocrat style uh, uh, left-hand table. There's your favorite mod. Yeah. F sharp armbar, and it does have adjustment screws. Looking good. Yep, there you yeah. go. You can see custom bis, uh, pearl with it. Uh, let's see, what else? Oh yes, a custom, didn't originally have this low E flat combination forked E flat key guard. So when you're playing and this rests against you, it won't interfere with the opening of your E flat key. All right. Uh, let's see what else. Um, slider built into the low B flat. Okay, right in there, and that allows us to uh, adjust the opening height of my B flat pad. Very cool. Okay. So yeah, quite a bit, quite a bit of modifications. Ah, one really, really nice one is a front F. Okay, so this has all the key work of a modern soprano saxophone. It has the front F. It has the articulated G sharp. It has your your uh, adjustment screws for your F sharp armbar. It has key contacts galore. Okay, well a few a few here and there. It's an so. excellent example of taking a a, a good or or even depending on your opinion, great sounding vintage horn and making the mechanical workings of it conducive for a modern player. So you yeah. can, you know, and not that you can't play anything on a vintage horn, but this will make it much more comfortable and easy to handle and play. And they respond great. Absolutely. Ryan, I have one last question for you. Yes. Where, where can they get one of these types of saxophones this one or maybe you were referring to this guy right here either one uh you can actually get here at us 
or with us. Uh, both of these are for sale, and they Very probably cool. started life out looking something like this, maybe even a little bit uglier. We obviously brought them back, did our Uber haul, uh, did our silver plating procedure, and these are ready to go. Uh, Rue pads in both of them. I think this one has the black with the uh, gold domed. Uh, Rezos in it, yes. This one has, believe it or not, the original snaps in it. Very cool. Okay. So. okay. Well, Ryan, thank you so much for that excellent demonstration, telling us all about the different components that Busher makes or made back in the day, as well as the modifications that we do to them. If you want to get in on any of these saxophones, check them out in the Vintage Restored Saxophone section of musicmedic.com. Also take Busher Sax, put that in the comments below. That's going to give you a chance to win 15% off any of the courses that we have coming up in uh, the fall or 2024. There they are right there. So make sure you take hashtag Busher Sax, put that in the comments below. Uh, we're going to be back next week with a technician topic. We're going to go over how to uh, refinish a solder repair and uh, we'll be back with Ryan for that. So that's going to do it for right now. Until next time, happy repairing.